Welcome back everyone. Today we are doing some hot topics on food science notable news and today's hot topic of the day is going to be Buttergate from March of 2021 and I'm going to give you a little bit of background here but I don't need to jump in and do one of those. You're going to learn this because honestly this is more of a, a news feature just to talk about some of the current affairs that are going on in food science land. So um, a number of uh, different blog sites, in particular Juicy, uh, Julie Van Rosendahl, who is a food writer for a number of different newspapers in Canada, uh, had started to highlight back in the wintertime that consumers were picking up on the fact that butter wasn't spreading the same way as normal. And this got coined as Buttergate by a, a few different people, in particular uh, my friend Sylvain Charlevoix, who is professor of um, agri-food um, management at Dalhousie University and Buttergate has gone through as a bit of a controversy that consumers are noticing difference in the functionality and if you really think about it over the period of COVID more consumers were at home baking more consumers were eating food products at home and had space and time for that mindfulness to pay attention to the quality of their ingredients. Now as more and more food writers jumped on uh, the investigation of this topic one key hypothesis came up, and that was that cows, when um, when thinking about the production of milk fat, you have to uh, provide a diet to the dairy cattle that's sufficient in calories so that they are going to be um, in a in a positive caloric state. If you think about it, if you are in a negative caloric state, you don't have enough diet um, and enough calories in the diet, then you are not going to be producing uh, fat in the milk as efficiently as you would be if you were in a positive caloric uh, status. And so dairy cattle uh, farmers are using different feed supplements to increase the caloric density of the food uh, that the cows are eating. And in particular, one feed ration that has been uh, used is the use of palm oil press cake or palm oil supplements as a feed ration. And the thought is that if you are feeding cows palm oil, that it's increasing the saturated fat in that butter. And so this has been something that has been investigated and there's some actual ongoing investigations. I'm part of the, the crew that is doing some of the data analysis and that uh, um, butter has been sent to a testing lab at the University of Guelph. But uh, the, the consortium of people that they want to have analyze it, they'd like to have a few different independent voices take a look at the data and come up with their conclusions. I'm just going to go through from a, a summary perspective what I'm observing in this data. So if you think about it, just in quick summary, when cows are in positive energy balance, they put more fat into their milk. And in Canada, we have milk marketing boards. The Dairy Farmers of Canada, um, the Dairy Farmers of Ontario, price the milk based off of a few different uh, key features from a quality perspective. And one of the price points is based off of the percent of milk fat. And so by increasing the, um, the energy balance in the cow's diet, it's going to increase the amount of fat that's put out into the raw milk. And therefore that's going to increase the, the price to the farmer. Secondly, there was a big spike in demand for butter at the grocery retail level because again people were staying at home and baking at home and preparing food at home and as such there was a bigger demand on on butter and as therefore they needed larger production so going back to some physiology cows have multiple stomachs and what what's going on with this feed supplement is that you have to create what's called a bypass fat you can't just feed the cows normal fat like you might see in corn or soybeans um, you have to create what's called a bypass fat, and it's a calcium salt of fatty acid. And it, that then allows the fat to pass by the first stomach, the rumen, which is very acidic, and it allows that fat to travel to the abomasum, which is uh, one of the later stomachs. As you know, cows and ruminants have four stomachs. And when the fat bypasses to the abomasum, then it allows, it, it goes straight to 
the energy balance rather than being digested and uh, modified in the rumen. And it just happens that saturated fats have the best stability for this formulation. Once upon a time, many, many years ago, it was not uncommon, and you're, you're going to want to cover your ears when I say this, but it was not uncommon for uh, cattle producers, dairy cattle included, to use beef tallow. And after the bovine spongiform encephalopathy or mad cow disease incident, um, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency made sure that uh, animal producers were not feeding back the source, uh, the source animal into the feed. So if you were a cow producer, you should not be feeding uh, byproducts of, of cows, in this case beef tallow, back to cows to increase their nutrition. Similar to other animal species, they wanted to make sure that that was not going to be a way of passing disease. And we're really, really cognizant of that right now. And so it just happens that saturated fats have really good stability for this bypass fat. And it's you can formulate it and it, and it sits in a stable form for um, blending and formulating of diets. And as such, palm oil, happened to be a really good substitute for the beef tallow that had been used historically. Now, where could fat and the, the texture of butter in particular be modified? Well, if let's go back to on the farm, and I'm going to pull up my whiteboard here and my pen, but cattle genetics, and if you think about it, uh, we're going down this whole value chain of how cows are being managed in the dairy operations to be able to create a quality product. Well, you could be selecting for um, increased fat production. In general, though, the, the, the genetics that we are selecting for in cows, they're looking for increase in lactation period and increase in volume of milk. Feed quality, this one is exactly where a lot of attention is being played because depending on what you are feeding cows is going to indicate the, the terminal fat in the product. So as, as you may have noticed in uh, the selection of different dairy products, you may see something like grass-fed. And if it's grass-fed, it, imp it could imply that the cows are pastured, but there are different uh, quality standards. You've likely noticed over the past few decades that once upon a time you would see fields of dairy cattle with the cows outdoors but over um, more scientific management they've they found that cows produce better if they are in a sheltered environment and so you will see more of these cows indoors and as such they need to have uh, formulated nutrition that said grass-fed could imply that they are being fed hay or being fed um being fed uh, a, a more grass-centered ration, but most cows are being a being fed a silage corn soybean ration, and oftentimes it's formulated such that it's somewhat hands-off. So grass-fed or formulated. The the dairy farmers of Ontario, the dairy farmers of Canada, have extensive nutrition services to make sure that the cows are being treated appropriately. And it just happens that the use of palm as a dairy feed additive has been permitted for um, quite a period of time. I haven't been able to find exactly how long, but it's been more than a decade that this has been used. So we've talked about feed quality and cattle nutrition. There has been some discussion about whether the role of the milking parlor has anything to do with it. Once upon a time, if you went back several decades, cows were being milked uh, two times per day. But now we're seeing more robotic milking. And the idea being that the cow can walk onto a conveyor belt sort of system and at any point in time that the cow feels uh, the urgency to be milked, they can walk into the system and a robotic system will automatically attach, allow for the milking process to occur and um, full sanitation and everything. And due to RFID tagging in the, the cow's ear tags, they're able to monitor the frequency of milking and the volume of milk that's produced by each of the cows. Robotic milking just happens to be beneficial in that it, it helps extend the lactation period of the cow, 
And it, because at any point in time uh, the cow feels an urgency to be milked, they can go and participate in the milking process. It actually has net benefits, but there has been some discussion over whether robotic milking allows the milk to remain in the udder long enough for the phospholipids to form around the, the lipid micelle within the milk such that it's going to form the same structures. But uh, there are on-the-farm implications that could be modifying the texture of the milk. Then, at the processor, there are additional issues that could be at, at play. Depending on the circumstances, there could be lipases in the milk. Lipases are going to take the triglyceride and create free fatty acids. And in general, um, lipase content is, is, is reasonably minimal in milk, but it's possible that you could have additional free fatty acids. From my perspective, I think that pasteurization and fat recrystallization is going to be a key feature, butter churning and butter working. And we're going to dig into these in a little bit more. But if you really think about what's going on in pasteurization, you have to heat the milk up. And so if you I'm sure you've all melted butter before, you're going to lose all of the crystalline structure that's there. And then what has to occur after that pasteurization is that you have to recrystallize. And a wide variety of different textbooks and handbooks. I reviewed the Tetra Pak um, handbook, the University of Guelph's handbook for dairy processing. Both of these documents indicate that depending on what's called the iodine value, the iodine value, the iodine value in milk indicates how much saturated fat And so depending on the iodine value, and you will see fluctuations in iodine value depending on the season and the amount of pasturing that the cows have uh, participated in and depending on the dietary ration, but depending on that iodine value, you will have different recrystallization protocols because uh, depending on how much saturated fat, that will indicate how the fat is going to recrystallize. And if you've got more saturated fat, saturated fat tends to be solid at room temperature versus um, some of the unsaturated fats, and those tend to be liquid at room temperature. Depending on the quantity of saturated fatty acids, it can form a really clear uh, crystalline uh, matrix, and you need to intersperse the... the um, the melted versus unmelted fats that are within the butter. You think of butter as being solid, but actually there's portions of that fat that are in the liquid phase. And depending on how that matrix is made up is going to indicate how solid that butter feels or not. Then we have the butter churning method, and there are a few different methods that are used for production of butter in, in Canada and North America. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But that classic beating of, of uh, milk is is sort of true, but there are a couple methods that can be used. And I actually have a later slide that I'll jump to. So if you really think about it, I, I keep thinking about here, it's, it's, it's almost like you have water that you need to form into ice, but ice could be snowflakes, ice could be uh, Icicles, ice could be ice cubes, ice could be a big huge block of ice. And all depending on how you recrystallize that and create the, the matrix of crystals, it's it's going to indicate the texture of that butter. So it's all, where, where did my pen go? And so we do note that in the milk handbooks that a lot of that recrystallization comes down to these three steps. How are you recrystallizing and aging? Is, so you have to do this recrystallization in a really slow and stepwise fashion. And in depending on the iodine value, you may need to cycle the temperature up and down. And this takes time. And I want to stress time equals money. And consumers like cheap Products. And so the more time it takes you to fabricate your product, the higher the cost of that product is going to be. 
And so I think this is going to play an important feature in um, the investigation in, into the butters because some of the premium butters that have premium price points, they are not afraid to take that time because people are willing to spend the money. Whereas in the in the uh, bargain butter, which is it's the volume butter that's sold in most of the grocery stores, they're not going to take that time. They need to push the butter out the door as fast as possible. And I don't think they're going to go through that recrystallization um, to get the right, what we call fat polymorphism. So let's jump forward to some of these additional slides. So this is uh, a diagram from the Dairy Processing Handbook, which is published by Tetra Pak. I've, I've provided the web page for you. And the Tetra Pak Handbook, it's an excellent resource and I highly recommend it's available free online if you are willing to register for it. What's going on here is that you're injecting cream into a, a dasher and it's, it's pushing that cream under pressure. It's then allowing that cream to coalesce into the particles. Those particles are pumped through a flotation churn. So they're they're agitated and uh, moved along this churn and they're floating upwards while the um, buttermilk, the, the fluid portion is drained off and then it goes through a washing process and then it goes under a vacuum where it's then worked and extruded out as final butter. And depending on how long and how much... Um, how much pressure you want to put this butter under. You can end up with products with different milk fats. You can work the butter longer or less in this process. And so you can have different amounts of working on that butter. Some of the ultra premium products are still produced in what's called a batch churn. And you can imagine this is almost like a big, huge washing machine or a cement mixer. They load it up with milk. They seal up the um, seal up the door with a gasket and it spins and it dashes like a almost like a washing machine or cement mixer until the butter uh, coalesces from the, the buttermilk. It's then dumped off into a hopper and the butter is then uh, worked or beaten into into the uh, final format to squeeze out a residual buttermilk. And uh, at that point too, you can also do salting and additional mixing. Now, this is... Um, this is a flowchart from the University of Guelph's Dairy Science and Technology ebook, which is uh, produced by Doug Goff, who's a who's a wonderful professor at the University of Guelph. And um, in this case, they're they're uh, in the flowchart. They're just mentioning churning here as a singular step, but churning could be a few other steps. And some of the uh, lower cost butters are produced in a different format and. I mentioned before how there are different uh, what are called polymorphisms. As fat crystallizes, a crystal in fat could mean a few different things. It could mean how those fats are, are, are stacking together. And so in most fats, there are alpha, beta prime, and beta um, crystalline forms in the, in the crystallization. I'm sure you've melted butter before and you put it back in the fridge and you end up with these big, almost uh, frosty crystals, which is very, very different than um, the this very smooth and creamy texture that you see in most butter. And part of that comes from the crystallization protocol and part of that comes from the reworking of that butter as well. You also then have this matrix of what is considered um, moisture droplets. How big are those moisture droplets versus how small? And that is dependent on how much the butter is worked and how much of the fat is in the um, semi-crystalline or semi-liquid semi state and or, or what they're calling here non-globular fat or, or pardon me, non-globular fat in the continuous phase versus globular fat versus crystalline fat. And each of those fats is going to give a slightly different mouthfeel and a slightly different texture. And again, that's dependent on the crystallization protocol that occurred during that post-pasteurization cooling of the cream, as well as the working of the butter after the churning process. Now, I mentioned that there are these churning processes. Oh, where is it in my slideshow? Um, there are that batch churning. So we saw the diagram of the batch churn. There is also that float churn. I can't spell 
today, float churn. That's where we had that that continuous uh, churn where it was that upwards uh, on a almost 45 degree angle churning and uh, creating butter on a continuous basis. There are then two other methods, and I couldn't find diagrams for this, but this is where you're taking uh, what they call the plastic fat, or you're making, uh, they separate out the cream, and they separate out the cream to be approximately 80% cream, and then they invert the emulsion. And the benefit of going with this process is that you don't have buttermilk being produced in the process. You are able to take that skim milk and divert it straight to um, fluid milk operations and the 80% cream um, through high efficiency centrifugation, you can then do by uh, emulsion inversion. So uh, just breaking that emulsion, it quickly converts from a mayonnaise almost, uh, the texture is almost like mayonnaise and it converts over into a butter type texture, which is then pumped and formed into the butter form. This is a very low cost way of producing the butter. And again, you think about it, it lacks all of that churning and working process that occurs in the more premium type butters. Last but not least is the uh, use of, oh, where's my pen? You use what's called anhydrous milk fat. And so in essence, you're taking butter or butter oil and you inject it almost like margarine. And the, the, really ridiculous, the really ridiculous thing is this anhydrous milk fat butter oil, it still fulfills Canada's standard of identity for production of butter in that the, uh, the standard of identity for butter is that it is uh, milk fat at a minimum of 80% with uh, ingredients including milk and or modified milk products. And so this is a modified milk product and therefore it can fulfill that. And it, and it, from a process perspective, you're injecting anhydrous milk fat into milk or other uh, phospholipids, um, salt into that solution. And you end up with a, a very texturally different product than standard butter, but it's extremely low cost. And again, consumers, their number one choice when selecting for food products tends to be by price point. So we talked about polymorphism and we talked about the uh, microstructure of butter and how that can impact on the textural properties of the butter itself too. So a lot of people have asked me, so which butter do you eat? And, and honestly, I buy a lot of butter. I like butter. <laughs> I buy, I, uh, I happen to buy a lot of the low cost discount brand butter. And oftentimes you will see this and, and it's made under private label. So um, on every package of butter, there's usually a four digit code. And while it's it, under the Safe Food for Canadians regulation, it's no longer required. Most, most manufacturers still put that four digit code. It's usually in a small lozenge shape and one, two, three, four, and it's usually on the package. You can then reverse look up who made the butter based off of that four digit code. So I often purchase the um, private label. So there's no our compliments factory. There are going to be other private label manufacturers that are producing that product. Now, Gailey is a national brand and they're going to be producing their product in their own facilities. But who knows, this compliments butter very well could be made by Gailey. Now, Thornlow just happens to be in um, Northern Ontario, and it happens to be a, a, an award-winning butter. I purchase different types of butter for different types of applications, personally. I purchase, I, I, I admit, I do like the Thornlow. I do not have any financial or other uh, conflicts to declare when it comes to me talking about butter, but uh, I like the Thornlow for table purposes. So I, I will have butter just for putting on toast, just for putting on baked goods, just for putting on vegetables at the table. And then I have lower cost butter for different applications, baking, frying, um, making um, Iranian rice and so on. And so I will purchase premium butter for that application. Um, I notice personally that I freeze a lot of butter. So when butter goes on sale, I will buy it in 
large quantity and freeze it. And I find that the textural attributes change again on the butter because you're forcing that uh, um, crystalline matrix into a different form again, and it changes the fat polymorphisms on, f on, f on freezing storage. And so the butter that I do freeze, I tend to only use for baking applications where um, the textural attributes of that butter are, are not important, whereas I'm going to be using a premium butter where the textural attributes and the spreadability is, does become important. Um, and so what's really, really fascinating to me is I, I think about when I go grocery shopping, and again, I'm going to inject some of my own opinion here, but oftentimes when I'm in the grocery store, I'm staring at the packages for so long, people think I must work at the store. And most recently, I was at the store looking for those four-digit establishment codes on the butter packages, and one person came up to me as, as they were looking and said, have you heard about Buttergate? And I'm like, yeah, I've heard a little bit about it. And they're like, yeah, they're feeding the cows palm oil. I don't think I trust the butter anymore. And of course, they go and grab the vegan margarine. And I'm scratching my head going, you do realize that the vegan margarine is made out of palm oil. And they're like, but I don't trust the butter. And I'm like, what is it about the butter that you don't trust? Well, the palm oil. And I'm like, but you're, eating, you're selecting a palm oil product where the number one ingredient is palm oil. Well, at least they're saying what there's in that. And I think that's really the key feature here is that um, we have been doing this for a long period of time. The transparency of the food industry has really declined over the past decades. And perhaps it always was that way. Perhaps it's just me paying attention and getting uh, higher up in my career from when I, was, when I was in grad school or whatever. But I find that the transparency and the desire for transparency is really, really high. Palm oil in foods does have a bit of a dirty, um, a dirty uh, history in that much of the palm plantations that have been created over the decades have been through the uh, deforestation of tropical rainforest. And that said, I don't know if we've had a better situation here in Canada and deforestation for the purposes of growing corn and soybean oil. Um, that said, the tropical rainforests are an important part of our carbon sink and an important part of global biodiversity. And it's easy to point fingers at one location versus the other and, and judge the other rather than judging ourselves. Um, from my perspective, I find that uh, I do trust the Canadian dairy system. I do use different butters for different applications. And I do appreciate the fact that I can go and purchase butter at a very competitive price point to make baked goods that I can share widely with my friends and family because they're affordable. But then I also appreciate the really delicious flavor of really good butter on freshly baked bread or freshly baked uh, um croissants or different products that I might make at home. And I find that the deliciousness of some of these premium butters is just, you get a much, much better mouthfeel and a much better flavor profile and much better eating experience. So from that perspective, I'm not one to be out judging how people are going to be feeding their cattle, but I understand that there's a trust aspect from the consumer to say that the the use of palm oil within the butter itself can be seen as problematic. Anyways, that's a quick summary about Buttergate from my perspective. And do watch this. I, I do believe there's going to be some more, um, more coverage of this because there is a consortium of a few of us, um, Sylvain Charlevoix, Alejandro Marangoni, Martin Scanlon, myself. There are a few scientists out there that are looking at some of the data sets and we're providing some different interpretations. And in the end... Um, I keep wondering what the what the core answer is. I don't doubt that feeding palm oil to cows is increasing the palm or the palmitic acid, the C16 content in the butter, but I think that there are still key features of fat polymorphism and butter working and butter churning methodology that the butter manufacturers may be a little bit reluctant to give up because it is it is proprietary to them. Um, that said, we do know that the ultra premium butters tend to be slow churned and that's indicated on their label and that tends to be those batch churns and as such they're going to be taking the time to put the care into that fat polymorphism and the, the quality evaluation of the butter 
um, at the manufacturing level. All right, that's enough of me talking about butter. We will talk to you again real soon. I love to hear about your ideas for hot topics. Now that our semester is wrapping up and I'm moving into summer period, it will be a time for me to make videos a little bit more for fun than just to fulfill uh, curriculum content. So send me ideas for videos that you'd like to see and watch for it. You might, you might see your video show up on the channel. Take care. We'll talk to you real soon.